Good morning, everyone. Good morning. おはようございます。早晨。早上好。スラマパギー。What else? <laughs> Good morning, Mia. I knew you are the one in there lurking. <laughs> How do you say good morning in Korean? I've never learned Korean. I didn't even know Nuna meant like elder sister when I made that name. I was supposed to name Arya Noon because I like three syllables name, but、uh, it wasn't available. I wonder who's the Arya Noon in this world. Whoever the fuck took my name.、Uh, And then just need I just kept adding letters and syllables, and it pe- became Ariana Nuna because I like it when it rhymes. So that's how I become Ariana Nuna, and then everyone told me that oh Nuna meant big sister in Korean. It's only used by male younger brother or. Younger male towards an elder sister. It's pretty interesting. I don't know much about Korean culture.、Uh, I know a lot about K-pop, but I don't listen to K-pop. I'm like, sp- I'm like spitting out fun facts about me right now.、Um, the only Korean I know is "Oh, 안녕하세요, 감사합니다, 미안해." <laughs> The typical K drama. I don't even watch K drama. I know controversial opinion. Like I don't like K drama. I hate K drama. I hate K drama with all my heart. Like I've like there are some people who try to make me watch and get interested in K drama, and I sit there and when I watch it with all the slow motion shot of like the male character just walking, I just want to punch the TV so hard that it breaks. So yeah, K drama is not my thing, obviously.、Um, I like Korean stuff. Like Korean food is really good. Like whenever I like a culture, it's usually their food. <laughs> I'm definitely more of a weep. I would say I like Japanese stuff more.、Um, But I don't mind. I have traveled to Cor-、uh, Seoul a few times, and I'm I'm still planning to go back. Uh, Cor- South Korea's uh, co- I'm a big coffee buff. I like coffee a lot. So, uh, South Korea has like a booming third wave coffee culture going on right now. Good morning, Andotodox. Good morning. I'm I'm so thankful that Ando is always here and it make, always makes me smile whenever I see your name whenever you come in. I'm very happy that you are here, even though you're not in game but in spirit and in my channel, you are here and I really appreciate it. Yeah, so, so no, I'm I'm from the generation where J-pop is a thing. Ah.、Uh, A, a big thing.、Uh, I have to take the effort to go and get、uh, Ayumi Hamasaki CD that is not pirated. I want to buy the original.、Uh, pretty much like how K-pop fans do nowadays, except except um. K-pop fans nowadays they buy like multiple. Pe- I mean, J-pop do the same. Like、uh, AKB forty six, forty six. That's K K Izaka.、Uh, AKB forty eight fans they buy multiples as well, just just to bump up the numbers to the millions. But、uh, I think Ayumi Hamasaki fans aren't like that. I think Ayumi Hamasaki fans are more. Ah,、uh, really likes her and.、Uh, I used to be a Ayumi Hamasaki fan until she went off the rail and just stuck at the mid two thousand sound, and she just doesn't evolve ever. And she has all these s- weird, uh, what do you call it?、Uh, weird, like you know, bad publicity, good publicity thing going on by her publicists, and I really hated it. So I just dropped her off my radar, and I went back to my first love. Um.、Uh, 
Utara Hikaru. So, yeah. Um Yeah. So, now my favorite singer is uh, Utara Hikaru. Definitely. Uh her latest album is stuck in my head forever. There's a particular song that really really resonates with me right now. It's called Find Love. Uh try to go listen to it if you can. Um it's and the entire day they have they have two versions of the song, one in English and one in Japanese. The uh, uh both of them really good but uh if you are if you want a uh, an easier understanding of the lyrics and what it the song represents, the English version is to go and it's easier to sing along with it. Uh I I resonate a lot with that <laughs> with that song right now. Uh it, it it would be the kind of song when uh in years to come when I listen to it back and I will remember the moment I'm in right now. That kind of song. Yeah. Oh Mia is here, isn't it? Oh <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I still haven't gotten Chewy the doggo. It's really it's really expensive, and I don't have a I don't know is it a botanist or something retainer that get it? I don't have that. I have a Fisher. Yeah, I I wouldn't say OG J-pop fan. I I'm very selective. When I like someone, I just like that someone. Uh, I'm usually very loyal when it comes to things. Um, I um. Uh, maybe I should change one of my retainers to botanist because I do have a botanist at level 80 and I should level my botanist to 90. Anyway, OG, I wouldn't say I'm an OG J-pop fan because I, I when I like someone, I just like someone. I don't like like a, the, a whole lot of them. So I like Utada when Utada first came out and then later on I discovered Ayumi Hamasaki uh, and... Um, that time it was basically me trying to find a replacement for Britney Spears because B Britney was way out, like she was having all those issues at the time. So, uh, Ayumi Hamasaki fit in the role of, you know, uh, I don't know, like a lot, like to this day, if I go to a karaoke, I'll still sing a lot of Ayumi Hamasaki older songs, but I don't know anything about her nowadays anymore. Like, I catch up more on Hiki. Uh, Otada Hikaru. Um, uh, I I know a lot about K-pop because I generally, when I'm interested in something, I like to find out more about it. I I like to I like to read a lot about J-pop, the K-pop drama. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was like. But I remember there was one time. It, I was like kind of like having fun and just like talking to my uh, partner Zapok like in real life and then I was like oh there's nothing interesting in today's K-pop story and stuff like that because I just I just follow K-pop for its drama basically I don't really listen to like th there's sorry there are a few songs that I do like I'm not gonna lie I'm not gonna deny it but um I'm not gonna let y'all know what songs I like from K-pop, <laughs> but um, but I remember there was one time I was like, kind of like jokingly say like, ah, nobody died today on K-pop, and then a few days later, um, the news of J Jonghyun from Shiny, uh. Passed away due to uh, depression, and from that time on, I just stopped saying it that way. Like, oh, nobody died today on K-pop, because I didn't realize how serious it was. The industry treats uh, the uh, uh, the artist. Good morning, Flynn. Sorry, you came in at a time when I'm talking about suicide. Hell yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Flynn. Hey, what's up? But yeah, um, 
I follow K-pop just for its drama. I think it's hilarious whenever they are like fan dramas or fan war. I, it's it's an entertainment to me. Basically, it's like watching a reality show, and it's and it's reality, not just fake reality. You get what I mean? I'm I must I'm both a sadist and mas masochist at the same time. I'm weird. Um, yeah. But yeah, I used to really like Ayumi Hamasaki. I can still sing all Ayumi Hamasaki songs. Uh, I can still belt it out. I I can never sing Utada Hikaru songs uh, in karaoke because her there's no way you can sing Utada Hikaru songs. Her voice is just too good, and she can go so low and then go so high at the same time. And if even if you like, you know, put, you know, you can adjust like the. Um, what do you call that? Like the pitch of the song, even though you can adjust the pitch of the song in the karaoke machine, right? It there's no way you can adjust Otada Hikaru's song because even if you put it low, it her her low part will be so low for you to sing, and then her high part is still too high for you to sing. So Otada Hikaru's songs are not karaoke friendly. Uh, Ayumi Hamasaki songs are very karaoke friendly. I would say I can. I just need to put one pitch down and I can sing Ayumi Hamasaki songs. Um, yeah, I would. But yeah, I wouldn't say I'm OG J-pop fan. I just like several one. I don't. I never like AKB. Uh, yeah, and I and if you notice the pattern here, I only listen to female singers. I don't like male singers. I would say the only male singers I like is like what, I don't know, Chad Baker, Frank Sinatra. Uh, <laughs> uh, like I I would listen to, Guess No Kiwami, but, uh, but I don't know, I don't particularly like his voice. I just like the music. You know what I mean? Anyway. You see, that's the thing. That's the thing with that's the, that's the thing with with Utada Hikaru. All of you only listen to Utada Hikaru through Kingdom Hearts. I I implore. I implore all of you to go and listen to Utada Hikaru's uh, discography, not just Kingdom Hearts songs. Because she's so much more than just the songs that she made up for Kingdom Hearts. Like, sure, like, her Kingdom Hearts songs, the only one that I like is Hikari. Which is called Simple and Clean in English. I hate that. I, I don't know, I hate the, the title in English, but I like Hikari, the Japanese version. Because I'm a weeb. Um, and then I like... Uh, her newest album, a lot of her songs in her newest album is like my favorite. Her Hatsukoi is amazing. Uh, Kingdom Hearts songs, uh, Chikai. Chikai is, is fucking great. I love Chikai. But I implore you guys, listen to uh, her discography. Even the English one where she sings, I'm Japanese, Neasy, Easy Breezy. Like, even the cringy ones. Go listen to it. Udala has a wide range of uh, um, musical talent and a wide range of musical styles that she very uh, because she's Amer she's more like if you want to think about it she's more American than Japanese to be honest right um, but. She's very daring when it comes to experimenting with music. So I implore you guys to listen to her discography, not just the Kingdom Hearts songs. Because the Kingdom Hearts songs, they're good, they're alright. But yeah, there's so much better songs beyond Kingdom Hearts songs. Yeah. Classy jazz for Nuna. <laughs> uh, I enjoy jazz and Bossa Nova, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah I really lo like her her latest album Bad Mode is so good. So please listen to Bad Mode. 
listen to bad mode listen to my favorite like there's so many bad mode uh kimini uh kimini muchu uh pink blood uh dare ni mo iwanai fine love uh oh like her newest album all of them are so good and you have to listen to them in in like really good earphones or he- headphones and you can hear the sound mixing is so good she's just so daring she's so good anyway enough gushing about utaba hikaru um today nudible i'm going to take a sip of my coffee and we shall start our reading because we are way off the time for reading i don't know how many chapters we are going to do but uh i'm going to stop at one o'clock sharp anyway so 115 let's give it 115 okay we'll stop at 115 of reading one moment for coffee and i shall start Today, we are reading Kazuo Ishiguro, first novel. I believe it is written in 1982. First published in 1982. A Pale View of Hills by Kazuo Ishiguro, Part 1, Chapter 1. Nikki, the name we finally gave my younger daughter, is not an abbreviation. It was a compromise I reached with her father, for paradoxically it was he who wanted to give her a Japanese name, and I, perhaps, out of some selfish desire not to be reminded of the past, insisted on an English one. He finally agreed to Nikki thinking it had some vague echo of the East about it. She came to see me earlier this year, in April, when the days were still cold and drizzly. Perhaps she had intended to stay longer, I do not know. But my, but my country house and the quiet that surrounds it made her restless, and before long I could see she was anxious to return to her life in London. She listened impatiently to my classical records, flicked through numerous magazines. The telephone rang for her regularly and she would stride across the carpet and her thin figure squeezed into her tight clothes, taking care of the, to close the door behind her so I would not overhear her conversation. She left after five days. She did not mention Keiko until the second day. It was grey, windy morning, and we had moved the armchairs nearer to the windows to watch the rain falling on my garden. Did you expect me to be there? she asked. At the funeral, I mean. No, I suppose not. I didn't really think you would come. It did upset me, hearing about her. I almost came. I never expected you to come. People didn't know what was wrong with me, she said. I didn't tell anybody. I suppose I was embarrassed. They wouldn't understand really. They wouldn't understand how I felt about it. Sisters are supposed to be people you are close to, aren't they? You may not like them that much, but you are still close to them. That's just not how it was though. I don't even remember what she looked like now. Yes, it's quite a time since you saw her. I just remember her someone, her as someone who used to make me miserable. That's what I remember about her, but I was sad though when I heard. Perhaps 
it was not just the quiet that drove my daughter back to London. For Rodo, we never dwelt long on the subject of Keiko's death. It was never far away, hovering over us whenever we talked. Keiko, unlike Nikki, was pure Japanese, and more than one newspaper was quick to pick up on this fact. The English are fond of the idea that our race has an instinct for suicide, as if further explanations are unnecessary. For that was all they reported, that she was Japanese, and that she hung herself in her bedroom. That same evening, I was standing at the windows, looking out into the darkness, when I heard Nikki say behind me, What are you thinking about now, mother? She was sitting across the settee, a paperback book on her knee. I was thinking about someone I used to know, a woman I once knew. Someone you knew when you, before you came to England? I knew her when she, I was living in Nagasaki, if that's what you mean. She continued to watch me, so I added, long time ago, long before I met your father. She seemed satisfi- satisfied with some vague comment return. She seemed satisfied and with some vague comment, she returned to her book. In many ways, Nikki is an affectionate child. She had not come by simply to see how I had taken the news of Keiko's death. She had come to, s- to me out of sense of mission. For, in recent years, she has taken it upon herself to admire certain aspects of my past, and she had come prepared to tell me things were no different now, that I should have no regrets for those choices I once made. In short, to reassure me that I was not responsible for Keiko's death. I have no great wish to dwell in Keiko now. It brings me little comfort. I only mention her here because those were the circumstances around Nikki's visit this April. And because it was during that visit I remembered Sachiko again. After all this time, I never knew Sachiko well. In fact, our friendship was no more than a matter of several weeks one summer many years ago. The worst days were over by then. American soldiers were as numerous as ever, and for there was fighting in Korea, but in Nagasaki, after what had gone before, those were the days of calm and relief. The world had a feeling of change about it. My husband and I lived in an area to the east of the city, a short tram journey from the center of the town. A river ran near us, and I was once told that before the war, a small village had grown up on the river bank. But then, the bomb had fallen and afterwards all that remained were ch- charred ruins. Rebuilding had got underway and in time, four concrete buildings had been erected, each containing 40 or so separate apartments. Of the four, our block had been built last and it marked a point where the rebuilding program had come to a halt between us and the river lay an expanse of waste ground, several acres of dried mud and ditches. Many complained it was a health hazard, and indeed, the drainage was appalling. All year round, there were craters filled with stagnant waters, and in the summer months, the mosquitoes became intolerable. From time to time, officials were to be seen pacing out measurements or scribbling down notes, but the months went by and nothing was done. The occupants of the apartment blocks were much like ourselves, young married couples, husbands having found employ- good employment within with expanding firms. Many of the apartments were owned by the firms who rented them to employees at a generous rate. Each apartment was identical. The floors were tatami, the bathrooms and kitchen of a western design. 
They were small and rather difficult to keep cool during the warmer months, but on the whole, the feeling amongst the occupants seemed one of satisfaction. And yet, I remember an unmistakable air of transience there, as if we were all just waiting for the day we could move to something better. One wooden cottage had survived both the devastation of the war and the government bulldozers. I could see it from our window, standing alone at the edge of the expanse of waste ground, practically on the edge of the river. It was the kind of cottage often seen in the countryside, with a tiled roof sloping almost to the ground. Often, during my empty moments, I would stand at my window, gazing at it. To judge! From the attention attracted by Sachiko's arrival, I was not alone in gazing at that cottage. There was much talk about two men were, were seen working there one day. As to whether or not they were government workers, later there were talks that a woman and her little girl were living in there, and I saw them myself on several occasions making their way across the ditchy ground. It was towards the, de the beginning of summer. I was in my third or fourth month of pregnancy by then when I first watched that large American car, white and battered, bumping its way over the waste ground towards the river. It was well into the evening and the sun setting behind the cottage gleam a moment against the metal. Then, one afternoon, I heard two women talking at the tram stop about the woman who had moved into the derelict house by the river. One was explaining to her companion how she had spoken to the woman that morning and had received a clear snub. Her companion agreed the newcomer seemed unfriendly, proud probably. She must be thirty at least, they thought, for the child was at least ten. The first woman said the stranger had spoken in a Tokyo dialect and was certainly not from Nagasaki. They discussed her for, her for a while, her American friend. Then, the woman spoke again about how unfriendly the stranger had been to her that morning. Now, I do not doubt that amongst those women I lived with, there were those who had suffered and those with sad and terrible memories. But to watch them each day busily involved with their husbands and their children, I found this hard to believe that their lives had never, had ever helped the tra tragedies and nightmares of wartime. It was never my intention to appear unfriendly, but it was probably true that I made no special effort to seem otherwise. For at that point in my life, I was still wishing to be left alone. It was with interest then I listened to those women talking of Sachiko. I can recall quite vividly that afternoon at the tram stop. It was one of the first days of bright sunlight after the rainy season in June, and the soak surfaces of brick and concrete were drying all around us. We were standing on a railway bridge and on one side of the tracks at the foot of the hill, could be seen a cluster of roofs, as if houses had come tumbling down the slope. Beyond the houses, a little way off, were our, our apartment blocks standing like four concrete pillars. I felt a kind of sympathy for Sachiko then, and felt I understood something of that aloofness that I had noticed about her when I had watched her from afar. We were to become friends that summer, and for a short time, at least, I was to be admitted into her confidence. I'm not sure how it was we first met. I remember one afternoon spotting her figure ahead of me in the path leading out of the housing precinct. I was hurrying, but Sachiko walked on a steady stride. By that point, we must have already known each other by name. For I remember her calling to her as I got nearer. Sachiko turned and waited for me to catch up. Is something wrong? She asked. I'm glad I found you. <sighs> I said, a little out of breath. Your daughter, she was fighting just as I came out, back there, near the ditches. 
She was fighting? With two other children. One of them was a boy. It looked a little... It looked a nasty little fight. I see. Sachiko began to walk again. I fell in step behind... Beside... I fell in step beside her. I don't want to alarm you, I said. But it did look quite a nasty fight. I, in fact, I think I saw a cut on your daughter's cheek. I see. It was back there, on the edge of the waste ground. And they are still fighting, do you think? She continued to walk up the hill. Well, no, I saw your daughter running off. Sachiko looked at me and smiled. Are you not used to seeing children fight? Well, children do fight, I suppose, but I thought I ought to tell you. And you see, I don't think she's on her way to school. And the other children carried on towards the school, but your daughter went back towards the river. Sachiko made no reply and continued to walk up the hill. As a matter of fact, I continued, I had meant to mention to this to you before. You see, I have seen your daughter on a number of occasions recently. I wonder perhaps if she hasn't been playing a truant a little. The path fork up the par the path fork at the top of the of the hill. Sachiko stopped and returned to each other. It's very kind of you to be so concerned, Etsuko, she said. So very kind. I am sure you will make a splendid mother. I had supposed previously, like the other woman at the tram stop, that Sachiko was a woman of thirty or so, but possibly her youthful figure had been deceiving, for she had the face of an older person. She was gazing at me with slightly amused expression. Something in the way she did so caused me to laugh self-consciously. I do appreciate your coming to find me like this, she went on. But as you see, I'm rather busy just now. I have to go into Nagasaki. I see. I just thought it's best to come and tell you, that's all. For a moment, she did continue to look at me with her amused expression. Then she said, How kind you are. Now please, excuse me. I must get into town. She bowed, then turned towards the path that led up towards the tram stop. It's just that she had a cut on her face, I said, raising my voice a little. And the river's quite dangerous in places. I thought it's best to come and tell you. She turned and looked at me once more. If you have, if you have nothing else to concern yourself with, Etsuko, she said, then perhaps you would care to look after my daughter for the day. I will be back sometime in the afternoon. I'm sure you will get on very well with her. I wouldn't object if that's what you wish. I must say, your daughter seems quite young to be left on her own all day. How kind you are, Sachiko said again. Then she smiled once more. Yes. I'm sure you'll make a splendid mother. After parting with Sachiko, I made my way down the hill and back through the housing precinct. I soon found myself back outside our apartment block, facing the expanse of waste ground, seeing no sign of the little girl I was about to go inside. But then, caught sight of some movement along the riverbank. Mariko must previously have been crouching down, for now, I could see her small figure quite clearly across the muddy ground. At first, I felt the urge to forget the whole matter and return to my housework. Eventually, I began making my way towards her, taking care to avoid the ditches. As far as I remember, that was the first occasion I spoke to Mariko. Quite probably, there was nothing so unusual about her behavior that morning, for, after all, I was a stranger to the child, and she had every right to regard me with suspicion. And in fact, I did experience a curious feeling of unease at the time. It was probably nothing more than a simple response to Mariko's manner. The river that morning was still quite high and flowing swiftly after the rainy season a few weeks earlier. 
The ground sloped down steeply before it reached the water's edge, and the mud at the foot of the slope, where the little girl was standing, looked distinctly wetter. Mariko was dressed in simple cotton dress which ended at her knees, and the short trim hair made her face look boyish. She looked up, not smiling, to where I stood at the top of the muddy slope. Hello, I said. I was just speaking with your mother. You must be Mariko-san. The little girl continued to stare up at me, saying nothing. What I thought earlier to be a wound on her cheek, I now saw to be a smudge of mud. Shouldn't you be at school? I asked. She remained silent for a moment. Then she said, I don't go to school. But all children must go to school. Don't you like to go? I don't go to school. But hasn't your mother sent you to school here? Mariko did not reply. Instead, she took a step away from me. Careful, I said. You fall into the water. It's very slippery. She continued to stare up at me from the bottom of the slope. I could see her small shoes lying in the mud beside her. Her bare feet, like her shoes, were covered in mud. I was just speaking with your mother, I said, smiling at her reassuringly. She said it would be perfectly alright if I ca- if you came and waited for her at my house. It's just over there, that building over there. You could come and try some cakes I made yesterday. Would you like that, Mariko-san? And you could tell me all about yourself. Mariko continued to watch me carefully, then, without taking her eyes off me, she crouched down and picked up her shoes. At first, I took this as a sign that she was about to follow me. But then, as she continued to stare up at me, I realized she was holding her shoes in readiness to run away. I'm not gonna hurt you, I said with a nervous laugh. I'm a friend of your mother's. As far as I remember... That was all that took place between us that morning. I had no wish to alarm the child further, and before long I turned away and made my way across the waste ground. The child's response had, it is true, upset me somewhat. For in those days, such small things were capable of arousing in me every kind of misgiving about motherhood i told myself that the episode was insignificant and in that any case further opportunities to make friends with the little girl were bound to present themselves over the coming days as it was i did not speak to mariko again until one afternoon a fortnight or so later I had never been inside a cottage prior to that afternoon, and I had been rather surprised when Sachiko had asked me in. In fact, I had sensed immediately that she had done so so with something in mind, and it turned out I was not mistaken. The cottage was tidy, but I remember a kind of stark shabbiness about the place, the wooden beam that crossed the ceiling looked old and insecure, and a faint odour of dampness lingered everywhere. At the front of the cottage, the main partitions had been left wide open to allow the sunlight in across the veranda. For all that, much of the place remained in shadow. Mariko was lying in the corner furthest from the sunlight. I could see something moving beside her in the shade. And when I came closer, I saw a large cat curled up on the tatami. Hello, Mariko-san, I said. Don't you remember me? She stopped, stroking the cat and looked up. We met the other day, I went on. Don't you remember? You were by the river. The little girl showed no signs of recognition. She looked at me for a while and began began to stroke her cat again. Behind me, I could hear Sachiko preparing tea on the open stove at the center of the room. I was about to go over to her and while, when Mariko suddenly said, She's going to have kittens. Oh, really? How nice. Do you want a kitten? That's very kind of you, Mariko-san. We'll see, but I'm sure they'll all find nice homes. Why don't you take a kitten? The child said, 
The other woman said she would take one. We'll see, Mariko-san. Which other woman was this? The other woman. The woman was across the river. She says that she would take one. But I don't think anyone lives over there, Mariko-san. It's just trees and forests over there. She said she would take me to her house. She lived across the river. I didn't go with her. I look at the child for a second. Then a thought struck me and I laugh. <laughs> but that was me, Mariko-san. Don't you remember? I asked you to come to my house while your mother was away in town. Mariko looked up at me again. Not you, she said. The other woman, the woman from across the river. She was here last night when mother was away. Last night? While your mother was away? She said she would take me to her house, but I didn't go with her because it was dark. She said we could take the lantern with us. She gestured towards the lantern hung on the wall. But I didn't go with her because it was so dark. Behind me, Sachiko got onto her feet and was looking at her daughter. Mariko became silent, then turned away and began once more to stroke the, her cat. Let's go out on the veranda, Sachiko said to me. She was holding the tea things on a tray. It's cooler out there. We did as suggested, leaving Mariko in her corner. From the veranda, the river itself was hidden from view, but I could see the ground slope down and the mud became wetter as it approached the water. Sachiko seated herself on a cushion and began to pour the tea. The place is alive with stray cats, she said. I'm not so optimistic about these kittens. Yes, there are so many strays, I said. It's such a shame. Did Mariko find her cats around here somewhere? No, we brought the cute creature with us. I would have preferred to leave it behind myself, but Mariko couldn't bear couldn't hear it. You brought it all the way here? From Tokyo? Oh no. We've been living in Nagasaki for almost a year now, on the other side of the city. Oh really? I didn't realize that. You live there with uh, friends? Sachiko stopped pouring and looked at me, and the teapot held in both hands. I saw her engage something of that amused expression with which she had observed me on that earlier occasion. I'm afraid you're quite wrong, Etsuko, she said eventually. Then she began to pour the tea again. We were staying at my uncle's house. I assure you, I was merely... Yes, of course, there's no need to get embarrassed. Is there? She laughed and passed me my cup. I'm sorry, Etsuko. I don't mean to tease you. As a matter of fact, I did have something to ask of you. A little favor. Sachiko began to pour tea into her own cup, and as she did... Sorry? And as she did so, a more serious air seemed to enter her manner. Then, she put down the teapot and looked at me. You see, Etsuko, a certain arrangement I have made have not gone as planned. As a result, I find myself in need of money. Not a great deal, you understand? Just a small amount. I quite understand, I said, lowering my voice. It must be very difficult for you, with Mariko-san, to think of. Etsuko, may I ask a favor of you? I bowed. I have some savings on my own, I said, almost in a whisper. I'll be pleased to be of some assistance. To my surprise, Sachigo laughed out loudly. <laughs> You're very kind, she said. But I didn't in fact want you to lend me money. I had something else in mind. You mentioned something the other day. A friend of yours who ran a noodle shop. Mrs. Fujiwara, you mean? You were saying that she may want an assistant. A small job like that would be very useful to me. Well, I said uncertainly. I could inquire if you wish. That would be very kind. Sachiko looked at me for a moment. But you look rather unsure about it, Atsuko. 
Not at all. I'll inquire when I next see her, but I was just wondering. I lowered my voice again. Who would look after your daughter during the day? Mariko? She could help at the noodle shop. She's quite capable of being useful. I'm sure she is, but you see, I'm not certain how Mrs. Fujiwara would feel. After all, Mariko in reality should be in school during the day. I assure you, Etsuko, Mariko won't be the slightest problem. Besides, the schools are closing next week, and I'll make sure she won't get in the way. You can rest assured on that. I bowed again, and I said, I'll inquire when I next see her. I am very grateful to you. Sachiko took a sip from her teacup. In fact, perhaps I could ask you to see your friend within the next few days. I'll try. You are so kind. We fell silent for a moment. My attention had been caught earlier by Sachiko's teapot. It appeared a fine piece of craftsmanship made from a pale china. The teacup I now held in my hand was of the same delicate material. As we sat drinking our tea, I was struck, not for the first time, by the odd contrast of the tea set alongside the shabbiness of the cottage and the matty ground beneath the veranda. When I look up, I realized Sachiko had been watching me. I'm used to be... I'm used to good crockery, Etsuko. I'm used to good crockery, Etsuko, she said. You see, I don't always live like this. She waved her hand towards the cottage. Like this. Of course, I don't mind a little discomfort, but about some things, I still rather discerning. I bowed, saying nothing. Sachiko also began to study her teacup. She continued to examine it. Examine it. Examine it, turning it carefully in her hands. Then suddenly she said, I suppose it's true to say I stole this tea set. Still, I don't suppose my uncle would miss it much. I looked at her, somewhat surprised. Sachiko put the teacup down in front of her and waved away some flies. You were leaving at your uncle's house, you say? I asked. She nodded slowly. A most beautiful house. With the pond in the garden, are very different from these present surroundings. For a moment, we both glanced towards the inside of the cottage. Mariko was laying in her corner just as we had left her. Her back turned towards us. She appeared to be talking quietly to her cat. I didn't realize, I said. When neither of us had spoken for some time, that anyone lived across the river. Sachiko turned and glanced towards the trees on the far bank. No, I haven't seen anyone. But your babysitter, Marikos, was saying she came from over there. I have no babysitter, Hatsuko. I know nobody here. Mariko was telling me about some lady. Please don't pay attention. You mean she was just making it up? For a brief moment, Sachiko seemed to be considering something. Then she said, Yes. She was just making it up. Well, I suppose children often do things like that. Sachiko nodded. When you become a mother, Etsuko, she said, smiling, you need to get used to such things. We drifted on to the other subjects then. Those were early days in our friendship, and we talked mainly of little things. It was not until one morning, some weeks later, that I heard Mariko mention again a woman who had approached her. The end of chapter one. I'm gonna take a sip of my tea and I'll be right back.
Chapter Two. In those days, returning to a Nakagawa district still provoked in me mixed emotions of sadness and pleasure. It was a hilly area, and climbing again those steep, narrow streets between the clusters of houses never failed to fill me with deep sense of loss. Though not a place I visited on casual impulse, I was unable to stay away for long. Calling on Mrs. Fujiwara aroused in me much the same mixture of feelings, for she had been amongst my mother's closest friends, a kindly woman with hair that was by then. Turning grey, her noodle shop was situated in a busy side street. It had a concrete forecourt under the cover of an extended roof, and it was there her customers ate at the wooden tables and benches. She did a lot of trade with office workers during their lunch breaks and again on their way home, but at other times of the day, the clientele became sparse. I was a little anxious that afternoon. For it was the first time I had called at the shop since Sachiko had started to work there. I felt concerned on both their behalves, especially since I was not sure how genuine Mrs. Fujiwara had wanted an assistant. It was a hot day, and the little side street was alive with people. I was glad to see. I was glad to come into the little shade. Mrs. Fujiwara was pleased to see me. She set me down at a table, then fetch, then went to fetch some tea. Customers were few that afternoon. Perhaps there were none. I do not remember, and Sachiko was not to be seen. When Mrs. Fujiwara came back, I asked her, "How is my friend getting along? Is she managing well?" Your friend. Mrs. Fujiwara looked over her shoulder towards the doorway of the kitchen. She was peeling prawns. I said, "I expect she'll be out soon." Then, as if on second thoughts, she got on her feet and walked towards the kit and walked a little way towards the doorway. Sachiko-san, she called. "It's guys here." I heard a voice reply from within. As she sat down again, Mrs. Fujiwara reached over and touched my stomach. It's beginning to show now, she said. You must take good care from now on. I don't do a great deal anyway, I said. I lead a very easy life. That's good. I remember my first time. There was an earthquake, quite a large one. I was carrying Kazuo then. He came perfectly healthy though. Try not to worry too much, Atsuko. I try not to. I glanced towards the kitchen door. Is my friend getting on well here? Mrs. Fujiwara followed my gaze towards the kitchen. Then she turned to me again and said, "I expect so. You're good friends, aren't you?" "Yes. I haven't found many friends where we live, and I'm very glad to have met Sachiko." "Yes, that's very fortunate." She sat there, looking at me for several seconds. "Sachiko, you're looking rather tired today." I suppose I am. I laugh a little. It's only to be expected, I suppose. Yes, of course. Mrs. Fujiwara kept looking into my face. But I mean, you look a little miserable. Miserable? I certainly don't feel it. I'm just a little tired. But otherwise, I've never been happier. That's good. You must keep your mind on happy things now. Your child and the future. Yes, I will. Thinking about the child cheers me up. Good, she nodded, still keeping a gaze on me. Your attitude makes all the difference. A mother can take all the physical care she likes. She needs a positive attitude to bring up a child. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I said with a laugh. Sachiko had made. A noise made me look towards the kitchen again, but Sachiko was still not in sight. There's a young woman I see every week. Mrs. Fujiwara went on. She must be six or seven months pregnant. I see her every time I go to the cemetery. I've never spoken to her, but she looks so sad, standing there with her husband. It's a shame. A pregnant girl and her husband spend spending their Sundays thinking about the dead. I know they are being respectful, but at the same time, I think it's a shame.
They should be thinking about the future. I suppose she finds it hard to forget. I suppose so. I feel sorry for her, but she should be thinking ahead now. That's no way to bring a child into the world visiting the cemetery every week. Perhaps not. Cemeteries are no places for young couple. Kazuo comes with me sometimes, but I never insisted. It's time he started looking ahead too. How is Kazuo? I ask. Is his work coming on well? His work's fine. He's expecting to be promoted next month, but he needs to give other things a little thought. He won't be young forever. Just then, my eyes caught by a small figure standing out in the sunlight amidst the rush of passerby. Why isn't that Mariko? I said. Mrs. Fujiwara turned in her seat. Mariko-san? She called. Where have you been? For a moment, Mariko remained standing out in the street. Then, she stepped into the shade of the forecourt, came walking past us and sat down at an empty table nearby. Mrs. Fujiwara watched her little girl, then gave me an uneasy look. She seemed about to say something, then she got up to her feet and went over to the little girl. Mariko-san? Where have you been? Mrs. Fujiwara had lowered her voice, but I was still able to hear. You're not to keep running off like that. Your mother's very angry with you. Mariko was studying her fingers. She did not look up at food, Mrs. Fujiwara. And please, Mariko-san, you are never to talk to customers like that. Don't you know it's very rude? Your mother was very angry with you. Mariko went on studying her hands. Behind her, Sachiko appeared in the doorway of the kitchen. Seeing Sachiko that morning, I recall I was struck afresh by the impression that she was indeed older than I had expected. Sorry, I had first supposed. With her long hair hidden away inside a handkerchief, the tired areas on of her skin around her eyes, mouth seemed somehow more pronounced. Here's your mother now, said Mrs. Fujiwara. I expect she's very angry at you. The little girl had remained seated with her back to her mother. Sachiko threw a quick glance towards her, then turned to me with a smile. How do you do, let's go? She said with an elegant bow. What a pleasant surprise to see you here. At the other end of the forecourt, two women in the office clothes were sitting themselves at the table. Mrs. Fujiwara gestured towards them, then turned to Mariko once more. Why don't you go into the kitchen for a while? She said in a low, very, in a low voice. Your mother will show you what to do. It's very easy. You, I'm sure a clever girl like you could manage. Mariko gave no sign of having heard. Mrs. Fujiwara glanced up at Sachiko, and for a brief ex instant, I thought they exchanged cold glances. Then, Mrs. Fujiwara turned and went off towards her customers. She appeared to know them, for as she walked across the forecourt, she gave them a familiar greeting. Sachiko came and sat at the edge of my table. It's so hot inside the kitchen, she said. How are you getting on here? I asked her. How am I getting on? Well, let's go. It's certainly an amusing sort of experience working in a noodle shop. I must say, I never imagined I would one day find myself scrubbing tables in a place like this. Still, <laughs> it's quite amusing. I see. And Mariko, is she settling in? We both glanced over to Mariko's table. The child was still looking down at her hands. Oh, Mariko is fine, said Sachiko. Of course, she'd rather, she's rather restless at times, but then you could hardly expect otherwise under the circumstances. It's regrettable, Etsuko, but you see, my daughter doesn't seem to share my sense of humor. She doesn't find it quite amusing here. Sachiko smiled and glanced towards Mariko again, then got on her feet and went over to her. She asked quietly, Is it true what Mrs. Fujiwara told me? The little girl remained. She says you were being rude to the customers again. Is that true? Mariko still gave no answer. Is it true what she told me, Mariko? Please answer when you are spoken to. The woman came around again. Said Mariko. 
last night while you were gone. Sachiko looked at her daughter for a second or two. Then she said, I think you should go inside now. Go on, I'll show you what you have to do. She came again last night. She said she'd take me to, to her house. Go on, Mariko. Go on to the kitchen and wait for me in there. She's going to show me where she lives. Mariko, go inside. Across the forecourt, Mrs. Fujiwara and the two women were laughing loudly about something. Mariko continued to stare at her palms. Sachiko turned away and came back to my table. Excuse me a moment, Atsuko, she said, but I left something boiling. I'll be back in just a moment. Then, lowering her voice, she added, You could hardly expect her to get enthusiastic about a place like this, can you? She smiled and went towards the kitchen. At the doorway, she turned once more to her daughter. Come on, Mariko, come inside. Mariko did not move. Sachiko shrugged, then disappeared inside the kitchen. One moment for tea. Around the same time in early summer, Ogata-san came to visit us. His first visit seems moving away from Nagasaki earlier that year. He was my husband's father, and it seems rather odd. I've always thought of him as Ogata-san, even in those days when that was my own name. But then, I had known him as Ogata-san for such a long time, since long before I had ever met Jiro. I had never got used to calling him father. There was little family resemblance between Ogata-san and my husband. When I recall Jiro today, I picture a small stocky man wearing a stern expression. My husband was always fastidious about his appearance and even at home, he would frequently dress in shirt and tie. I see him now, as I saw him so often, seated on the tatami in our living room, hunched over his breakfast or supper. I remember he had the same tendency to hunch forward in a manner not unlike of that of a boxer, whether standing or walking. By contrast, his father would always sit with his shoulders flung well back, had a relaxed, generous manner about him. When he came to visit that summer, Ogata-san was still in. was still in his best of health, displaying a well-built physique and robust energy of a ya- much younger man. I remember the morning he first mentioned Shigeo Matsuda. He had been with us for a few days by then, apparently finding the small square room comfortable and enough for an extended stay. It was a bright morning and the three of us were finishing breakfast when Jiro left for the office. This school reunion of yours. He said to Jiro, that's tonight, isn't it? No, tomorrow evening. Will you be seeing Shigeo Matsuda? Shigeo? No, I doubt it. He doesn't usually attend these occasions. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry to be going off and leaving you, father. I'd rather give the thing a miss, but that may cause offense. Don't worry. etsuko san will look after me well enough, and these occasions are important. I'll take some days off work, Jiro said, but we are so busy just now. As I say, this order came into the office the day you arrived, a real nuisance. Not at all, his father said. I understand perfectly. It wasn't so long ago I was rushed off my feet with work myself. I'm not so old, you know. No, of course. We ate on silent. We ate on in silence for several moments, and Ogata-san said. So, you don't think you'll be running into Shigeo Matsuda? But you still see him from time to time? Not so often these days. We've gone such separate ways since we got older. Yes, this is what happens. Pupils go all, all go separate ways, and then they find it so difficult to keep in touch. That's why these reunions are so important. 
one shouldn't be so quick to forget the old allegiance. And it's so good to take a glance back now and then. It helped keep things in perspective. Yes, I think you should, you should certainly go along tomorrow. Perhaps father will still be us with, uh, with us on Sunday, my husband said. Then perhaps we could go out somewhere for the day. Yes, we can do that. A splendid idea. But if you have to work to do, if you have work to do, it doesn't matter in the least. No, I can leave Sunday free. I'm sorry to be so busy at the moment. Have you asked any of your old teachers along tomorrow? Ogata san said, I ask. Not that I know of. It's a shame teachers aren't asked more often to these occasions. I was asked along from time to time when I was younger. We always made a point of inviting our teachers. I think it's only proper. It's the opportunity for a teacher to see the fruits of their work and for the pupils to express their gratitude to him. I think it's only proper that the teachers are present. Perhaps you're right. Men these days forget so easily to whom they owe their education. Yes, you're very right. My husband finished eating and laid down his chopsticks and poured him some tea. An odd little thing happened the other day, Ogata san said. In retrospect, I suppose it's rather amusing. I was at the library in Nagasaki and I came across this periodical. A teacher's periodical. I've never heard of it. It wasn't in existence in my days. To read it, you would think all the teachers in Japan were communists now. Apparently, communism is growing in the country, my husband said. Your friend, Shigeo Masuda, had written in it. Now, imagine my surprise when I saw my name mentioned in this article. I didn't think I was so noteworthy these days. I'm sure father is still remembered very well in Nagasaki, I put in. It's quite ordinary. He was talking about Dr. Endo and myself, about our retirements, and if I understood him correctly, he was implying that the profession was well rid of us. In fact, he went as far as to suggest we should have been dismissed at the end of the war. Quite extraordinary. Are you sure it's the same Shigeo Matsuda? Asked Jiro. The same one, from Kuriyama High School. Extraordinary. I remember when he used to come to our house to play with you. Your mother used to spoil him. I asked the librarian if I could buy a copy. She said she would order one for me. I'll show it to you. It seems very disloyal, I said. I was so surprised, Ogata-san said, turning to me. And I was the one who introduced him to the headmaster at Kuriyama. Jiro drank up his tea and wiped his mouth with his napkin. It's very regrettable. As I say, I haven't seen Shigeo for some time. I'm sorry, father, but you must excuse me now or I will be late. Why, certainly. Have a good day at work. Jiro stepped down by the entryway, where he started to put on his shoes. I said to Ogata-san, Someone who reached your position, father, must expect a little criticism that is only natural. Of course! <laughs> Don't concern yourself about it, Etsuko. I hadn't given it a second thought. I just happened to think of it because Jiro was going to his reunion. I wonder if Endo read the article. I have you have a good day, father, Jiro called from the entryway. I'll try to be back a little earlier if I can. Nonsense! Don't make such a fuss! Your work is important. A little later that morning, Ogata-san emerged from his room dressed in his jacket and tie. Are you going out, father? I asked. I thought I'll just pay a visit to Dr. Endo. Dr. Endo? Yes, I thought I'll go and see how he was keeping up these days. But you're not going before lunch, are you? I thought I'll be better go quite soon, he said, looking at his watch. Endo lives quite a little way outside Nagasaki now. I'll need to get on a train. Well, let me pack you a lunchbox. It won't take a minute. Why, thank you, Etsuko. In that case, I'll wait for a few minutes. In fact, I was hoping you would offer to pack my lunch. Then you should have asked, I said, getting to my feet. 
You won't always get what you want by just hinting like that, father. I know you would pick me up correctly, Etsuko. I have faith in you. I went through the kitchen, put on some sandals and stepped down to the tiled floor. A few minutes later, the partition slid open and an Ogata-san appeared at the doorway. He seated himself at the threshold to watch me working. What is it that you are cooking me there? Nothing much. Just some leftovers from last night. At such short notice, you don't deserve any better. And yet you managed to turn it into something quite appetizing, I'm sure. What is that you're doing with the egg? That's not a leftover, isn't it? I'm adding an omelette. You're very fortunate, father. I'm in such a generous mood. An omelette? You must teach me how to do that. Is it difficult? Extremely difficult. It will be hopeless you trying to learn at this age. But I'm very keen to learn. And what do you mean at this age? I'm still young enough to learn many new things. Are you really planning to becoming a cook, father? There's nothing to laugh at. I've come to appreciate cooking over the years. It's an art. I'm convinced of it. Just as noble as painting or poetry. It's not appreciated simply because of the product disappears so quickly. Persevere with painting, father. You do it much better. Painting. <sighs> It doesn't give me the satisfaction it once did. No, I think I should learn to cook omelettes as well as you do, Etsuko. You must show me before I go back to Fukuoka. You wouldn't think it's such an art once you learn how it was done. Perhaps women should keep these things secret. He laughed as if to himself and then continued to watch me quietly. Which are you hoping for, Etsuko? He asked eventually. A boy or a girl? I really don't mind. If it's a boy, we could name him after you. Really? Is that a promise? On the second thought, I don't know. I was forgetting what f father's first name was. Seiji. That's an ugly sort of name. But that's because you find me ugly, Etsuko. I remember one class of pupils decided as a symbol hippopotamus but you shouldn't be put off by such outer trappings that's true well we'll have to see what Jiro thinks yes but I would like my son to be named after you father that would make me very happy he smiled and gave me a small bow but then I know how irritating it is when relatives insist on having children named after them. I remember the time my wife and I argued over what to call Jiro. I wanted to name him after an uncle of mine, and my wife disliked the practice of naming children after relatives. Of course, she had her way in her end. Keiko was a woman to but was a hard woman to budge. Keiko is a nice name. Perhaps if it's a girl, we could call her Keiko. You shouldn't make such promises so rashly. You'll make an old man very disappointed if you don't keep them up. I'm sorry. I was just thinking aloud. And besides, at school, I'm sure there are others you would prefer to name your child after. Others you are closer to. Perhaps, but if it's a boy, I would like him to be named after you. You were like a father to me once. Am I no longer like a father to you? Yes, of course, but it's different. Jiro is a good husband to you, I hope. Of course, I couldn't be happier. And the child will make you happy. Yes, it couldn't have happened at a better time. We are quite settled here now, and Jiro's work is going well. This is the ideal time for this to have happened. So you're happy? Yes, I'm very happy. Good. I'm happy for you both. There, it's ready for you. I handed him the lacquer lunchbox. Ah, yes, the leftovers, he said, receiving it with a dramatic bow. But he lifted the lid a little. It looks delightful, though. When I eventually went back to the living room, Ogata-san was putting on his shoes in the entryway. Tell me, Etsuko, he said, not looking up from his laces. Have you met this Shigeo Matsuda? Once or twice. He, he used to visit us after we were married. But he and Jiro aren't such close friends these days. 
Hardly. We exchanged greeting cards, but that's all. I'm going to suggest to Jiro he writes to his friends. Shigeo should apologize, or else I'll have to insist Jiro dissociates himself from that young man. I see. I thought of suggesting it to him earlier, when we were still talking at breakfast, but then that kind of talk is best left till the evening. Yeah, probably, right? Ogata-san thanked me once more for the lunchbox before leaving. As it turns out, he did not bring the matter up that night. They both seemed tired when they came in and spent most of the evening re reading newspapers, speaking very little. Only once did Ogata-san mention Dr. Endo that was supper and he simply said, Endo seemed well. He misses his work though. After all, the men live for it. In bed that night before we sleep, I said to Jiro, I hope father's quite content with the way we are receiving him. What else can he expect? My husband said. Why don't you take him out somewhere if you are so worried? Will you be working on Saturday afternoon? How can I afford not to? I'm behind schedule as it is. He happened to choose the most difficult times to visit me. It's just too bad. But we could still go out on Sunday, couldn't we? I have a feeling I did not receive a reply then. Though I lay gazing up into the darkness in waiting, Jiro was often tired after the day's work and not in mood for conversation. In any case, it seems I was worrying unduly about Ogata-san for his visit that summer turned out to be one of his lengthiest. I remember he was still with us that night Sachiko knocked on our apartment door. She was wearing a dress I had never seen before, and there was a shawl wrapped around her shoulders. Her face had been carefully made up, but a thin strand of hair had come loose and was hanging over her cheek. I'm sorry to disturb you, Etsuko, she said, smiling. I was wondering if by any chance Mariko was here. Mariko? Why no? Well, never mind. You haven't seen her at all? I am afraid not. You have lost her? There's no need to look like that, she said with a laugh. It's just that she wasn't in the cottage. When I got back, that's all. I'm sure I'll find her soon. We were talking at the entryway and I became aware of Jiren and Ogata-san looking towards us. I introduced Sachiko and they bowed to each other. This is worrying, Ogata-san said. Perhaps we'd better phone the police right away. There's no need for that. Said Sachiko, I'm sure I'll find her. But perhaps it's best to be safe and phone anyway. No, really. A slight hint of irritation had entered Sachiko's voice. There's no need. I'm sure I will find her. I'll help you look for her, I said, starting to put on my jacket. My husband looked at me disapprovingly. He seemed about to speak, but then stopped himself. In the end, he said, It's almost dark now. Ririri. Atsuko, there's no need to make such a fuss, Sachiko was saying, but if you don't mind coming out for a minute, I'll be most grateful. Take care, Atsuko, Ogata-san said, and phone the police if you don't find the child soon. We descended the flight of stairs. Outside, it was still warm, and across the waste ground, the sun had sunk very low, highlighting the muddy furrows. Have you looked around the housing precinct? I asked. No, not yet. Let's look then. I began to walk rapidly. Does Mariko have friends she may be with? I don't think so. Really, let's go. <laughs> Sachiko laughed and put his arm, put, put, a, put a hand on my arm. There's no need to be so alarmed. Nothing will happen to her. In fact, Etsuko, I really came round because I want to tell you some news. You see, it's all have been settled at last. We are leaving for America within the next few days. America? Perhaps because of Sachiko's hand on my arm. Perhaps out of sheer surprise, I stopped walking. Yes, America. You have no doubt heard of such a place. She seemed pleased at my astonishment. I began to walk again. Our precinct was an expanse of paved concrete, interrupted occasionally by thin young trees planted when the buildings had gone up. Both the lights had come out on us in most of the windows. Aren't you going to ask me anything more? Sachiko said, catching up on me. Aren't you going to ask me why I'm going and who I'm going with? 
I'm very glad if this is what you wanted, I say. But perhaps we should find your daughter first. Etsuko, you must understand. There's nothing I am ashamed of. There's nothing I want to hide from anyone. Please ask me anything you want. I am not ashamed. I thought perhaps we should find your daughter first. We can talk later. <laughs> very well, Etsuko, she said with a laugh. Let's find Mariko first. We search the playing areas and walk around each of the apartment blocks. Soon, we found ourselves back where we started and we spotted two women talking by the main entrance to one of the, of the apartment blocks. Perhaps those ladies over there could help us. Sachiko did not move. She looked over at the two women then said, I doubt it. But they may have seen her. They may have seen your daughter. One moment, please. Sachiko continued to look at the women, then she gave a short laugh and shrugged. Very well, she said. Let's give them something to gossip about. It's no concern of mine. We walked over to them and Sachiko politely and calmly made her inquiries. The women exchanged concerned looks, but neither had seen the little girl. Sachiko assured them that there was no cause for alarm and we took our leave. I'm sure that made the other days, she said to me. Now they'll have something to talk about. I'm sure they have no malicious thoughts whatsoever. They both seem genuinely concerned. You are so kind, Natsuko, but there's no need to convince me of such things. You see, it's never been my concern. Any concern to me, what people like that thought, and I care even less now. We thought we stopped walking. I threw a glance around me and up the apartment windows. Where else could she be? I said. You see, Etsuko, there's nothing I am ashamed of. There's nothing I want to hide from you or from those other women, for that matter. Do you think we should search by the river? The river? Oh, I've looked along there. What about the other side? Perhaps she's on the other side. I doubt it. Etsuko. In fact, if I know my daughter, she'll be, be back at the cottage at this very moment. Perhaps rather pleased with herself to have caused this fuss. Well, then let's go and take a look. When we came back to the edge of the waste ground, the sun was disappearing, silhouetting willow trees along the bank. There's no need to, for you to come with me, Sachiko said. I'll find her in good time. It's alright, I'll come with you. Very well, come with me. We began walking towards the cottage. I was wearing sandals and found it hard going on the uneven earth. How long were you out? I asked. Such girl was a pace or two ahead of me. She did not reply at first, and I thought possibly she had not heard me. How long were you out? I repeated. Oh, not long. How long? Half an hour? Longer? About... Three to four hours, I suppose? I see. We continued our ways across the muddy ground, doing our best to avoid any puddles. As we approached the cottage, I said, Perhaps we should look over on the other side, just in case. The woods? My daughter wouldn't be over there. Let's go take a look in the cottage. There's no need to look for so worried, Etsuko. She laughed again, and I thought her wo voice wobbled a little as she did. The cottage, having no electricity, was in darkness. We waited in the entryway while Sachiko stepped up to the tatami. She called her daughter's name and slid back into, slid back the partitions to the two smaller rooms adjoined the back one. I stood listening to her moving around in the darkness. Perhaps she came back to the entryway. Perhaps you're right, she said. We better look on the other bank. Along the river, the air was full of insects. We walked in silence towards the wood, small wooden bridge further down the stream. Beyond it, on the other side, on the opposite bank, were the woods Sachiko had mentioned. We were crossing the bridge when Sachiko turned to me and said rapidly, We went to a bar at the end. We were going to the cinema. 
to a film with Gary Cooper, but there was a long queue. The town was very crowded, and there were a lot of drunk people. We went to a bar in the end, and they gave us a little room to ourselves. I see. I suppose you don't go to bars, do you, Hetsuko? No, I don't. That was the first time I crossed the far side of the river. The ground felt soft, almost marshy under my feet. Perhaps it's just my fancy idea that I felt a cold touch of unease there on the bank. A feeling not unlike premonition which caused me to walk with renewed urgency towards the darkness of the trees before us. Sachiko stopped me. Grasping my arm, following her gaze, I could see a short way along the bank. Something like a bundle lying on the grass, close to the river's edge. It was a discernible in the gloom. A few shades darker than the ground. My impulse was to run towards it. Then I realized Sachiko was standing quite still, gazing towards that object. What is it? I said. Rather stupidly. It's Mariko, she said quietly. And when she turned to me, there was a strange look in her eyes. Chapter 3 It is possible that my memory of these events will have grown hazy with time, that things did not happen in quite the way they come back to me today, but I remember with some distinctness that eerie spell which seemed to bind the two of us as we stood there in the coming darkness, looking towards that shape further down the bank. Then the spell broke and we both began to run. As we came nearer, I saw Mariko lying curled on her side, knees hunched her back towards us. Sachiko reached the spot a little ahead of me. I was being slowed by my pregnancy, and she was standing over the child when I joined her. Mariko's eyes were open, and at first I thought she was dead. But when I saw them move, they stared up at us with a peculiar blankness. Sachiko dropped on one knee and lifted the child's head. Mariko continued to stare. Mariko-san, are you alright? I said a little out of breath. She did not reply. Sachiko was too silent, examining her daughter, turning her arms as if she was a fragile but senseless doll. I noticed blood on Sachiko's sleeve. Then I saw it was coming from Mariko. We had better call someone, I said. It's not serious, Sachiko said. It's just a graze. See? It's just a small cut. Mariko had been lying in the puddle, and one side of her short dress was soaked in dark water. The blood was coming from wound on inside of her thigh. Ma, what happened? Sachiko said to her daughter. What happened to you? Mariko went on looking at her mother. She's probably shocked, I said. Perhaps it's best not to question her immediately. Sachiko brought Mariko to her feet. We were very worried about you, Mariko-san, I said. The little girl gave me a suspicious look, then turned away and started to walk. She walked quite steadily. The wound on her leg did not seem to trouble her unduly. We walked back over the bridge and along the river. The two of them walked in front of me, not talking. It was completely dark by the time we reached the cottage. Sachiko took Mariko into the bathroom. I lit the stove in the center of the room and make, to make some tea. Aside from the stove, an old hanging lantern Sachiko had it provided, the only source of light, and large areas of the room remain in the shadows. In one corner, several tiny black kittens aroused by our arrival started to move restlessly. Their claws Catching in the tatami made a scuttling noise. When they appeared again, both mother and her daughter had changed into kimonos. They went through the one of the small adjoining rooms, and I continued to wait for some time. The sound of Sachiko's voice came through the screen. Finally, Sachiko came out alone. It's still very hot, she remarked. She crossed the room and slid 
apart the partition which opened out onto the veranda. How is she? I ask. She's all right. The cat's nothing. Sachiko sat down in the breeze next to the partition. Shall we report the matter to the police? The police? But what is there to report? Mariko said she was climbing a tree and fell. That's how she got her cut. But so she wasn't with anyone tonight? No. Who could she have been with? With? No. Uh, and what about this woman? I said. What woman? This woman that Mariko talks about. Are you certain she's imaginary? Sachiko sighed. <sighs> she's not entirely imaginary, I suppose, she said. She's just someone Mariko saw once. Once when she was much younger. But do you think she could have been here tonight, this woman? Sachiko gave a laugh. <laughs> no, it's a go. That's quite impossible. In any case, that woman's dead. Believe me, it's a go. All about this woman is just a little game Mariko likes to play when she means to be difficult. I've grown quite used to this little game of hers. But why should she tell stories like that? Why? Sachiko shrugged. It's just what children like to do. Once you become a mother, as a girl, you'll need to get used to such things. Are you sure she was with no one tonight? Quite sure. I know my own daughter well enough. We fell silent for a moment. Mosquitoes were humming in the air around us. Sachiko gave a yawn, covering her mouth with a hand. So you see, Etsuko, she said. I'll be leaving Japan very soon. You don't seem to be very impressed. Of course I am. And I'm very pleased. If this is what you wish for, but there won't be any various difficulties? Difficulties? I mean, moving to a different country with a different language and foreign ways. I understand your concerns, Etsuko, but really, I don't think there's much for me to worry about. You see, I've heard so much about America. It won't be like an entirely new foreign country. As for the language, I already speak it to an extent. Frank, San, and I, we always talk in English. Once I've been in America for a little while, I should speak it like an American woman. I really don't see there's any cause for me to be worrying. I know I'll manage. I gave a small bow, but said nothing. The two kittens began to make their ways towards where Sachiko was and where Sachiko was sitting. She watched them for a moment, then gave a laugh. Of course, she said. I sometimes have moments when I wonder how everything will turn out, but really... She smiled at me. I know I'll manage. Actually, I said, it was Mariko I had in mind. What will become of her? Mariko? Oh, she'll be fine. You know how children are. They'll find it so much easier to settle into a new surrounding, don't they? But it will still be an enormous change for her. Is she ready for such a thing? Sachiko sighed impatiently. <sighs> really, Etsuko, did you th really think that I had not considered all of this? Did you suppose I would decide to leave the country without having first given the most careful consideration to my daughter's welfare? Naturally, I said. You would give it the most careful consideration. My daughter's welfare is the utmost importance to me, Etsuko. I would not make any decisions that jeopardized her future. I would I've given the whole matter much consideration. And I've discussed it with Frank, I assure. Mariko will be fine. There will be no problems. But her education, what will become of that? Sachiko laughed again. Etsuko I'm not about to leave for the jungle. There are such things as schools in America, and you must understand, my daughter is a very bright child. Her father was an accomplished man, and on my side too, 
there were relatives of highest ranks. You must not suppose, Etsuko, simply because you have seen her in this, in this present surroundings that she's some peasant's child. Of course not. I didn't for one moment. She's a very bright child. You haven't seen her as she really is, Etsuko. In surroundings like this, you can only expect a child to prove a little awkward at times. But if you had seen her while we were at my uncle's house, you would have seen her true qualities then. If an adult addressed her, she would answer back very clearly and intelligently. There would be none of this giggling and shying away like most of the other children. And there were certainly none of these little games of hers. She went to school and made friends with the best kinds of children. And we had a private tutor for her and he praised her very highly. It was astonishingly how quickly she began to catch up. To catch up? Well, Sachiko gave a shrug. It's unfortunate that Mariko's education had to be interrupted from time to time. What with one thing and another, with our moving around so much, but these are difficult times we come up, we come true, Etsuko. It, if it wasn't for the war, if my husband was still alive, then Mariko would have had the kind of upbringing appropriate to a family of our position. Yes, I said, indeed. Perhaps Sachiko had caught something in my tone. She looked up and stared at me, and when she spoke again, her voice had become more tense. I didn't mean to leave Tokyo, Etsuko, she said, but I did. For Mariko's sake, I came all the way here to stay with my uncle's house because I thought it would be best for my daughter. I did not have to do that. I didn't need to leave Tokyo at all. I gave a bow. Sachiko looked at me for a moment, then turned and gazed out through the open partitions, out into the darkness. But you have left your uncle now, I said. And now you are about to leave Japan. Sachiko glared at me angrily. Why do you speak to me like this, Atsuko? Why is it that you can't wish me well? Is it simply that you are envious? But I do wish you well, and I assure you, I... Mariko will be fine in America. Why won't you believe that? It will be a better place for a child to grow up. And she will have far more opportunities there. Life's better for a woman in America. I assure you, I, I'm happy for you. As for myself, I couldn't be happier with things as they are. Jiro's work is going, is going well. And now, the child arriving just when we wanted it. She could become a business girl, a film actress even. America's like that, Etsuko. So many things are possible. Frank says, I could become a businesswoman too. Such things are possible out there. I'm sure they are. It's just that personally, I'm very happy with my life where I am. Sachiko gazed at the two little small kittens clawing at the tatami beside her. For several moments, we were silent. I must be getting back, I said eventually. They'll be getting worried about me. I rose to my feet. But Sachiko did not take her eyes off the kittens. When is it that you leave? I asked. Within the next few days, Frank will come and get us in his car. We should be on a ship by the end of the week. I take it that you won't be helping Mrs. Fujiwara much longer. Sachiko looked at, up at me with a short, incredulous laugh. <laughs> Etsuko, I'm about to go to America. There's no need for me to work anymore in the noodle shop. I see. In fact, Etsuko... Perhaps you would care to tell Mrs. Fujiwara what's happened to me. I don't expect to be seeing her again. Why won't you tell her yourself? She sighed impatiently. Oh, let's go. Can't you appreciate how loathsome it's been for someone such as myself to work each day in a noodle shop? But I didn't complain. And I did what was required of me, and now it's over, I have no great wish to see that place again. A kitten had been clawing at the sleeve at Sachiko's kimono. 
She gave it a sharp slap with the back of her hand, and the creature went scurrying back across the tatami. So, please, give my regards to Mrs. Fujiwara, she said, and my best wishes for her trade too. I'll do that. Now please excuse me, I must go. This time, Sachiko got on her feet and accompanied me to the entryway. I'll come and say goodbye before we leave, she said, as I was putting on my sandals. At first, it seemed a pretty innocent dream. I had merely dreamt of something I had seen the previous day, the little girl we had watched playing in the park, and then the dream came back the following night. Indeed, over the past few months, it has returned to me several times. Nikki and I watched the girl playing on the swings that afternoon we had walked into the village. It was the third day of Nikki's visit, and the rain had eased to a drizzle. I had not been out of the house for several days, and enjoyed the feel of air as we stepped into the winding lane outside. Nikki tended to walk rather fast, her narrow leather boots creaking with each stride. Although I found it no trouble keeping up with her, I would have preferred a more leisurely pace. Nikki, one supposed, has yet to learn the pleasures of walking for its own sake. Neither does she seem sensitive to the feel of the countryside despite having grown up here. I said as much to her as we walked and she retorted that this was not the real countryside, just a residential version to cater for the wealthy people who lived here. I dare say she is right. I've never ventured north to the agricultural areas of England where Nikki insists I will find the real countryside. Nevertheless, there's calm and quietness about these lanes I have come to appreciate over the years. When we arrived at the village, I took Nikki to the tea shop where I sometimes go. The village is small, just a few hotels and shops. The tea shop is on the corner of the street, upstairs above a bakery. That afternoon, Nikki and I sat at a table next to the windows, and it was from there we watched the little girl in the park below. As we watched, that she climbed on the swing and called out towards two women sitting together on a bench nearby. She was a cheerful little girl, dressed in a green Macintosh and a small Wellington boots. Perhaps you'll get married and have children soon, I said. I miss little children. I can't think of anything I would like less, said Nikki. Well, I suppose you're still rather young. It's nothing to do with how young or old I am. I just don't feel like having a lot of kids screaming around me. Don't worry, Nikki, I said with a laugh. I wasn't insisting you become a mother just yet. I had this passing fancy just now to become a grandmother, that's all, I thought. Perhaps you would oblige, but it can wait. The little girl, the little girl standing on the seat of the swing was pulling hard on the change, but on the chains, but somehow she could not make a swing go higher. She smiled anyway and called out again to the woman. A friend of mine just had a baby. She's really pleased, Nikki said. She's really pleased. I can't think why. Horrible screaming thing she produced. Well, at least she's happy. How old is your friend? Nineteen. Nineteen? She's even younger than you are. Is she married? No. What difference does that make? But surely she can't be happy about it. Why not? Just because she's not married? There's that. And the fact that she's only 19. I can't believe she's happy about that. What difference does it make whether she's married? She wanted it, she planned it and everything. Is that what she told you? But mother, I know her. She's a friend of mine. I know she wanted it. The women on the bench got to their feet. One of them called to the little girl. She came off the swing and went running towards the women. And what about the father? I asked. He was happy about it too. 
I remember when they first found out, we all went out to celebrate. But people always pretend to be delighted. It's like the film we saw on the television that night. What film? I expect you weren't watching it. You were reading the ma your magazine. Oh, that. You look awful. It certainly was, but that's what I mean. I'm sure nobody ever received news of a baby that, like that. These people do in these films. Honestly, mother. I don't know how you can sit and watch rubbish like that. You hardly used to watch television at all. I remember you used to keep telling me off because I watched it too much. I laughed. <laughs> you see how our roles are reversing, Nikki. I'm sure you are very good for me. You must stop me from wasting my time like that. As we made our way back from the tea shop, the sky had clouded over ominously, and the drizzle had become heavier. We had walked a little way past the small railway station, when a voice called from behind us, Mrs. Sheringham! Mrs. Sheringham! I turned and, small s and saw a small woman in an overcoat hurrying up the road. I thought it was you, she said, catching up with us. And how have you been keeping? She gave me a cheerful smile. Hello, Mrs. Waters, I said. How nice to see you again. It seems to have turned out all miserable again, hasn't it? Why, hello, Keiko. She touched Nikki's sleeve. I didn't realize, realize it was you. No, I said hurriedly. This is Nikki. Nikki, of course. How good gracious. You've completely grown up, my dear. That's how I got you all mother up. You have completely grown up. Nikki, of course. Hello, Mrs. Waters. Nikki said, rec recovering. Mrs. Waters lives not far from me. These days, I see her only very occasionally, but several years ago, she had given piano lessons to both my daughters. She had taught Keiko for a number of lessons, then Nikki for a year or so when she was still a child. It had not taken me long enough to see Mrs. Waters was still a very limited pianist, and her attitude in music in general had often irritated me. For instance, she would refer the works by Chopin and Tchaikovsky alike as charming melodies. But she was such an affectionate woman, I never had the heart to replace her. And what are you doing with yourself these days, my dear? She asked Nikki. Me? Oh, I live in London. Oh, yes? Well, what are you doing there? Studying? I'm not doing anything, really. I just live there. Oh, I see. But you're happy there, are you? That's the main thing, isn't it? Yes, I'm happy enough. Well, that's the main thing, isn't it? And what about Keiko? Mrs. Waters turned to me. How is Keiko getting on now? Keiko? Oh, she went to live in Manchester. Oh, yes. That's a nice city on the whole. That's what I've heard anyway. And does she like it up there? I haven't heard from her recently. Oh, well. No news is good news, I expect. Does Keiko still play the piano? I expect she still does. I haven't heard from her recently. My lack of enthusiasm finally... To pre finally to penetrate, and she dropped the subject with an awkward laugh. Such persistence on her part had characterized our encounters over the years since Keiko leaving home. Neither my evident reluctance to discuss Keiko, nor the fact until that afternoon I had been unable to tell her so much as my daughter's whereabouts had succeeded in making any lasting impressions upon her. In all probability, Mrs. Waters will continue to ask cheerfully after my daughter wherever we happen to meet. By the time we got home, the rain was falling steadily. I suppose I embarrassed you, didn't I? Nikki said to me. We were sitting once again in our armchairs looking out into the garden. Why do you suppose that? I said. I should have told her I was thinking of going to university or something like that. I don't mind in the least what you say about yourself. I am not ashamed of you. No, I suppose not. But I think you were rather offhand with her. You never, you never did like that woman much, did you? Mrs. Waters? Well, 
I used to hate those lessons she gave me. They were sheer boredom. I just go off in a dream and then now and then there'll be this little voice telling me to put my finger here or there or here. Was that your idea? Getting me to have lessons? <laughs> it was mainly mine, you see. I had great plans for you once. Nikki laughed. I'm sorry to be such a failure. But it was your own fault. I haven't got any musical sense at all. There's this girl in our house who plays the guitar and she's trying to... And she's trying to show me some chords but I couldn't be bothered to even learn those. I think Mrs. Waters put me off music for life. You may come back to it sometime and you will learn to appreciate having, bad, having had lessons. But I've forgotten everything I've ever learned. I doubt if you ha would have forgotten everything. Nothing you've learned at that age is totally lost. A waste of time anyway, Nikki muttered. She sat looking out the window for some time. Then she turned to me and said, I suppose it must be quite difficult to tell people about Keiko, I mean. It seemed easiest to say what I did, I replied. She rather took me by surprise. Yes, I suppose so. Nikki went on looking out of the window with an empty expression. Keiko didn't come to Dad's funeral, did she? She said eventually. You know perfectly well she didn't, so why ask? I was just saying that's all. You mean you didn't come to her funeral because she didn't come to your father's? Don't be so childish, Nikki. I'm not being childish. I'm just saying that's the way that she was. She was never part of our lives, not mine or dad's anyway. I never expected her to be at dad's funeral. I did not expect, I did not reply, and we sat silently in our armchairs. Then Nikki said, It was odd just now, with Mrs. Waters. It's almost like you enjoyed it. Enjoyed what? Pretending Keiko was alive. I don't enjoy deceiving people. Perhaps I snap a little, for Nikki looks startled. No, I suppose not, she said lamely. It rained throughout that night, and the next day, the fourth day of Nikki's stay, it was still raining steadily. Do you mind I change rooms tonight? Nikki said. I could use a spare room bedroom. We were in the kitchen washing the dishes after breakfast. The spare room? I laugh a little. They are all spare rooms now. There's no reason why you should keep you shouldn't sleep in the spare room. Have you taken a dislike to your old room? I feel a bit awkward. I feel a bit odd sleeping there. How unkind, Nikki. I hope you still feel it was your room. Yes I do, she said hurriedly. It's not that I don't like it. She fell silent. Wiping some knives with tea towel. Finally, she said, It's that other room. Her room. It gives me an odd feeling, the room being right opposite. I stopped what I was doing and looked at her sternly. Well, I can't help it, mother. I just feel strange thinking about that room being right opposite. Take the spare rooms by all means, I said coldly. But you need to make up the bed in there. Although I had made no... I had made a show of being upset by Nikki's request to change rooms. I had no wish to make it difficult for her to do so, for I too had experienced a disturbing feeling about that room opposite. In many ways, that room is the most pleasant in the house, with a pleasant, with a splendid view across the orchard. But it had been Keiko's fanatically guarded domain for so long. A strange spell seemed to linger there, even now, six years after she left it. A spell that had grown all the stronger now that Keiko was dead. For the two or three years before she finally left us, Keiko had retreated into the bedroom, shutting us out of her life. She rarely came out. Although, I would sometimes hear her moving around the house after we had all gone to bed. I surmised that she spent her time reading magazines and listening to her radio. She had no friends, and the rest of us were forbidden entry into her room. At meal times, I would leave her plate 
in the kitchen and she would come down to get it and then shut herself in again. The room, I realized, was in a terrible condition. An odor of stale perfume and dirty linen came from within, and on occasion I had glimpsed inside. I seen countless glossy magazines lying on the floor amidst heaps of clothes. I had to coax her to put out her laundry, and in this at least we reached an understanding. Every few weeks, I would find a bag of washing outside her door which I would wash and return. In the end, the rest of us grew used to her ways, and when, by some impulse, Keiko ventured down into our living room, we would all feel great tension. Invariably, these excursions would end up with her fighting with Nikki or with my husband. Then, she would be back in her room. I never saw Keiko's room in Manchester, the room which she died. It may seem morbid of a mother to have such thoughts, but on hearing of her suicide, the first thought that ran through my mind before I registered even the shock was to wonder how long she had been there like that before they had found her. She had lived amidst her own family without being seen for days on end. Little hope she would be discovered quickly in a strange city where no one knew her. Later, the coroner said she had been there for several days. It was the landlady who had opened the door thinking Keiko had left without paying rent. I found myself continually bringing to mind that picture of my daughter hanging in a room for days on end. The horror of that image has never diminished, but it has long ceased to be a morbid matter as with a wound on one's own body. It is possible to develop an intimacy with the most disturbing things. I'll probably be warmer in the spare room anyhow, Nikki said. If you're cold at night, Nikki, you can just simply turn up the heating. I suppose so. <sighs> she gave a sigh. I haven't slept well, ver very well lately. I think I'm getting bad dreams, but I can never remember them properly once I wake up. I had a dream last night, I said. I think it might be to do with the quiet. I'm not used to being so quiet at night. I dreamt about that little girl, the one we were watching yesterday, the little girl in the park. I can sleep right through traffic, but I've forgotten what it's like sleeping in the quiet. Nikki shrugged and dropped some cutlery into the drawer. Perhaps I'll sleep better in the, in the spare room. The fact that I mentioned my dream to Nikki the first time I had it indicates that I had doubts even then as to its innocence. I must have suspected from the start without fully understanding why that the dream had to do not so much with the little girl we watch but with my having remembered Sachiko two days previously. And that is the end of chapter 3 of part 1. And that is where I'm going to end today because I said that I'm going to end at 1 o'clock. And it's shop at 1 o'clock. Hell yeah. This is what you call good pacing, guys. Good writing pacing. This is why I like Kazuo Ishiguro. Can you imagine being a first-time writer of a novel and you really know how to pace your writing? That's how you do it. That's the problem with a lot of Japanese writers. And Kazuo Ishiguro is Japanese, but he grew up in um, England. So I would say he's more British than anything. Um, but yeah, that's how you do proper pacing. Sorry, I'm moving my. Oh, sorry. I'm moving my desk around. That's how you do proper pacing, guys. It's been a while that uh, a chapter actually ends properly at the right time. Like, three chapters. They all feel about the same pace. It's 
really good. That's how you do it, guys. That's why I like Hanzo and Ishiguro. How do you guys enjoy the story so far? I'm morbid, right? <laughs> I don't know why I always pick such morbid books. Um, hey now. <laughs> yeah. Well... The thing with my interest in um, books, I would say, is that <sighs> I like all media. I think in films and in book, in novels, I like to read about. Uh, Real people, real people emotions. I don't really pick. I don't really pick up fantasy or or science fictions and all those things. Um. Uh, I know a lot of people wanted me to read like. Law of the Rings and stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I I tend to get drawn towards like rather like in. Real life emotional themes stuff. Yep. Yeah. And that's what it is. But yeah, morbid shit. I like morbid stuff. Um, <laughs> that's the only way I can explain it. <laughs> but yep. Thank you. Um. My dear Mia Melanger, 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 uh, for being here with me today. <laughs> Let me take a quick picture. Yes, the only way to enjoy my reading is by munching on a. And on, on a bread, that's the only way to do it, bro. Yes. <laughs> Hang on. Hell yeah! Just me and you, Mia. Just me and you. <laughs> Aww, Taza. Did Taza walk in just now? Taza sent me a tell. Taza mina pink. Uh, nah, I'm terrible G poser. Don't know shit. I can't, like, seriously. Worse at it. Don't know how to do it. Absolute dog shit. I don't know. Like, uh, Taza sent me, like, a heart emoji. But yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think, uh, she, uh,. She came in, yeah, but she sent me a uh, she sent me a uh, oh my God, okay, closer, I just need to get pictures, okay, you know, to post on Twitter and stuff. Today, 
Oh, wait. Oh, me. Oh. I got a link from Nia. I hope it's not hentai porn. Oh my god. Oh, ah, so high. That's so high quality, Mia. And it's not hentai porn. Thank you. Oh my god. I love how my eyes stood out. Thank you so much. I'm gonna post it later. Oh my god, I'm gonna I wanna change my profile picture. Uh, <laughs> XCL will be sad. <laughs> 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 Don't click on any links that you just get, bruh. It could be anything, you know? Mm -hmm. Hentai tentacle pawns or I don't know. It's dangerous out there. The internet is a bad place, okay? Hello, uh, viewers. Um, are you new to my channel? Uh, there's six of you here. I uh, know Minya is here. Ando is here. I don't know if Flynn is still here. Uh, I know Neuro always lurk. See? I knew Neuro is lurking. I knew Neuro is lurking. Neuro is always fucking lurking in the background and waiting for me to say he hentai tentacle porn. See? I knew it. I knew Neuro is here. Hell yeah, Neuro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. The yeah, hentai tentacle porn is to lure him out. And then, uh, I'm maybe... I know... I, I know I know you are here. I know you are here. Uh, I'm thinking maybe Kazamina Pink is here. I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. Lurkers, uh, who is very quiet and silent. Uh, if this is your first time, I know it's very annoying for all those who know me already, but. To those who are here for the first time, if you don't know what this event is about, uh, I, I don't even know. On, I don't, do I call it an event? I don't know. But uh, this is a, 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 a book reading event. I call it all uh, Nudibles, which is a play on word on my name, Nuna, and Audible, where I select a book and I read it to my audience readers in the comfort of my my room basement basically uh my house sorry my my fc house basement uh i swear it is not a sex dungeon it is a uh, library with a good selection of books uh and i choose the bestest of the books um to read to you guys um and you can attend the event in-game and then uh, follow the link to my channel which is twitch tv twitch.tv slash ariana nuna which is what you are here right now you can also follow my twitter i have it linked in my socials uh, about me page um, i will announce every time i go live so and I'll announce what kind of book I'll read and all that. Uh, I'm very happy that I chose, uh, despite the morbidity of the um, the theme of the book uh, so far. I'm very glad that I've chose this book because I I miss having, I miss reading a book with good pacing because the previous few books have absolutely terrible pacing. It's so bad, especially the last one. The pacing is so bad. I'm not saying the story is bad. I'm not fond of the story either. Like, it's okay to me. Lonely Castle was okay to me. But, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, the pacing was really bad. It just kind of ruined it all for me, kind of. Uh, it is now 1 o'clock. Uh, if you guys want to claim any um, 
quote on love or you want to claim any poems reading with your banuna points or you want to claim a uh, tarot card reading a sloppy <laughs> tarot card reading because i'm not very good at it it's now time i give you about five minutes to decide or less oh, 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 oh god twist uh, yeah, oh yeah twisty is here Twisty uh, wants a uh, tarot card. Give me your instructions and I will do my job. Uh, I also understand that it's very uh, expensive to claim all these things because uh, I don't, I rarely stream nowadays and you guys might have difficulty. Getting banana points. Mind shuffle card of the day. Top draw. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Can you hear the deck? Okay. Nine shuffle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Card of the day for Twisty is Whoa! Ace of Sword is a really good card. Ace of Sword. Sword is usually about your your state of mind, your communication, your emotional, your psychological matters. <sighs> There's a quote in the chapter in the book uh under the ch uh the swords chapter in this book that I'm, I'm referring to um an old chinese proverb says life is pain pain makes you think thinking makes you wise and wisdom makes life endurable the swords represents this perspective so ace of swords let's go look at what ace of swords represents ace of swords oh it's a very i think it i think it's really really I, I it will resonate with you to see um keywords focus Beginnings, new ideas, opportunity, truth and clarity. Aces represents beginnings. This card heralds the initial stage of a new idea, spiritual direction, course of study, or intellectual project. Yep. So, this ace of sort indicates success through the mental the use of mental means or spiritual growth you're using your intellect in a clear focused way devoting yourself to a goal an opportunity is being offered to you grab it sometimes this card points to a breakthrough or inspiration i think it's i think it's quite re relevant to you right now isn't it <laughs> yeah, so Ace of Swords, very good card. Yeah, very timely, isn't it? Yeah, I feel that way too. It's very timely for you. Great card. Yeah, you don't have to claim. By the way, you can just ask me afterward. After this, we well, don't waste your points. Hey, right, anything else? Anyone wants to claim a poem, a uh, quote on love? Oh, let me know in the next two minutes, please. Ooh. Somebody already left. Have a safe journey, everyone. Oh, 
Oh my god, Neuro wants a tarot card too. Damn, son. Okay. Instructions, please. Should I make it cheaper? I think I should make it cheaper the next time. Wow. Same concept. Shuffle 5. Woof. You have so much confidence in the Shuffle 5. I'll give it to you. Shuffle 5. Card of the day. And top shot. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The top card of the day for Neuro is... Oh! <gasps> You got the Emperor, a major arcana. Wow, I haven't seen the Emperor out in like the longest time. <laughs> the Emperor, keywords, leadership. Masculine power, mature man, material success. As the title suggests, the emperor is a figure of supreme authority. Um, he is savvy and a brave warrior. He's a responsible civic leader. Uh, the emperor is an archetypal father figure. Just the emperor, like the empress is a mother figure. So when, when you get the Emperor in your reading look for issues related to authority although re the Emperor represents worldly power he's not the he's not despot or tyrant he wants the best for everyone he's a symbol of responsibility intelligence and courage who fights for what he believes in as such He's a protective male figure who teaches how to govern voicely in this world. He may also describe your own father and your relationship to him. So, basically, it could mean that you could be the emperor and you uh, have to handle certain things very seriously today in regards of work, study, money, relationship. Um, you have to be uh, I mean in a way careful and handle things maturely today or it could also mean that you will meet someone like the emperor today and you will learn something from him today it could mean anything basically I don't know. I don't know much Neuro as a person because he's a lurker. I know he enjoys uh, uh, tentacle hentai for sure. But yeah, <laughs> I'm accusing. I'm accusing people of liking tentacle hentai more. <laughs> Oh, look, look at that, look at, my, even my, <laughs> even my, my screen is showing the timing of this is too good. <laughs> By the way, um, if you are the emperor today, uh, take up some responsibility, um, do something good. Uh, teach people uh, edu like try to help people out um, they might find you uh, like oh, why are you so bossy but uh, you only want the best for them so that could be you or you could be finding someone like oh my god why are you so bossy but try to think from this point of view that this person is the emperor and he might seem bossy to you but he, he's actually here to help you so it could go either way so just keep in mind of that uh, for the day, and I hope you enjoy the the the, the tentacles on my 
Wow, I chose that specifically for Neuro. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't read well. I just I just like to make things super vague. Like you know? Cause I don't cause kind of the day is like so broad. The 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 that's why I sometimes I prefer questions Because questions, at least I, I can maybe like churn up an answer for you But Carve the Day is so broad that it could be anything It could be you are the Emperor or you or you will meet someone like the Emperor So yeah, I hope you- I hope that either way is gonna be good It's a good card You meet someone- if you meet the Emperor, you meet someone who are there to help you, to guide you Um or if you are the emperor, you are there to help people, to guide people, and to, um, yeah. So it's just a, it's a good card. It's a good card. <laughs> okay, one last request. A poem. Uh. Quote. I'm gonna give it. 30 seconds countdown 30 29 28 20, 20 Oh, Ando Is it too expensive? I think it's too expensive Maybe that's why you guys are hesitating And you, and I haven't streamed a lot lately I should make them cheaper I'll make them cheaper, okay? After, after this uh, I won't be a poem. Read a poem. Uh, let me choose a good book on poem. Pom, pom, pom. Okay, can you give me a page? You can choose a page from. You can choose oh, 25. Okay, good. Very fast response. Amazing. It would be so funny if it's. Okay, okay 25. 25 is actually uh, a part of 24. Um, it's quite a long one, but I'll read to you. Okay, it's gonna be worth your 800 points. But I'll lower the, the number down. <laughs> I will lower the points, okay. Okay, the, poems is, the poem is by Carol and Duffy. Title of the poem is Rings. I might have raised your hand to the sky to give you the ring surrounding the moon or look to tween the rings of your eyes with mine. Or added a ring to the rings of a tree by forming a handheld circle with you, thee, or walk with you, where a ring of church bells loop the fields, or kissed a lipstick ring on your cheek, or pressed flower, or met with you in the ring of an hour and another hour, I might have opened your palm. To the weather, turn and turn till fingers were ringed in rain, or held you close. They were playing our song in the ring of a slow dance, or carved our names in the rough ring of a heart, or heard the ring of an owl's hoot as we headed home in the dark, or the ring first thing of chorusing birds waking the house or given the ring of a boat rowing the lake or the ring of swans monogamous too or the watery rings made by the fish as they leaped and splashed or the ring of the sun's reflection there i might have tied a blade of grass a green ring for your finger or told you the ring of a sonnet by heart or brought you a lichen ring found 
on a warm wall or given a ring of ice in winter or in the snow sung with you the five gold rings of a carol or stolen a ring of your hair or whispered the words in your ear that brought us here where nothing and no one is wrong and therefore I give you this ring That's the poem Ring by Carol and Duffy. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Do you like my interpretation of it? <sighs> <laughs> Uh, no more nudibles. I mean, <laughs> not no more nudibles, but no more nudibles for this week. Uh, this is the last nudible for the week. Uh, the next nudible will be on next Monday, 11 a.m. GMT plus 8. All right. Hey, you, Jung, you are late as always. Uh, I'm ending the stream right now. Um, okay, so what's happening is um, no more notables for the rest of this week uh i'm busy tomorrow so i won't be streaming i won't be streaming today either um but i was i will oh really ah oh, so you are even more lurker than neuro is that's scary so you are the ultimate uh tentacle hentai lover all right Now I see who is the true tentacle hentai lover. Uh, anyways, uh, on Saturday, I will be streaming Yakuza 6 uh, at 2 p.m. GMT plus 8. Uh, if you guys are interested in watching me play Yakuza 6, please come and join me uh, and watch me punch people to death. I mean, they don't really die, but you know, they look like they are going to die. But yeah, uh, we're gonna go and play some mini games where we can watch some TTs. Uh, we're gonna go and do some sub stories where some weird shit is gonna happen. Uh, and uh, most importantly, we're just gonna try to get more money to go and watch more TTs. Uh, that's my mission for Yakuza 6. Uh, we will. I, I will stream on Saturday. I'll see you guys on Saturday if you guys are interested. And if you guys have no life like I do, <laughs> but I'll be busy today and tomorrow, so I will see you guys. Uh, if uh, you guys have not followed me on Twitter yet, please follow me on Twitter. I always announce whenever I go on stream. Um, I don't do announcement posters for Yakuza, so I will only a um, kind of announce it right before I go on stream or right when I go to stream. So po follow me on Twitter, basically, to catch all my things. Uh, I will have the vods ready for this. Uh, right after I I, I do I'm a very professional streamer. Ha 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 la mau. Uh, anyway Have a good day Have a good Thursday Thank you so much for being here with me for the entire time I really appreciate it As always, I love you guys And I'll see you guys on Saturday Goodbye